We often worry that the reason we hear nothing in our search for extraterrestrial intelligence is that to travel to other stars is just too hard. But what if a civilization decides it's just too dangerous to allow? Last year we released our Fermi Paradox Compendium, which was a staggering three hour long episode, and despite that we found that a lot of the entries in there had to get only surface detail in discussions, and in there and other episodes I suggested before that one of the more disturbing solutions is that a civilization might not permit space colonization, either from its own world or from any others that might arise nearby. I've never heard this given a name before, except as a subtype of stay-at-home civilizations, and indeed we are not actually thinking this would be a place where they just decide not to go settle the galaxy. We could imagine tyrannic empires that fear letting colonies slip away from them into distant interstellar space where they might escape their leash. However, a point I sometimes raise in our discussion of the Fermi Paradox, the big question of why our vast and ancient universe seems empty of other civilizations, is if you go out and colonize the galaxy long enough, you are going to find alien civilizations, simply because every colony you plant is going to begin diverging so heavily from each other, and you, that you'll eventually end up running into some unrecognizable distant cousin civilization. Centuries of signal lag and travel time separating planets where colonists live under alien suns and strange environments is going to cause a lot of change which is only exacerbated by options like transhumanism, genetic engineering, cybernetics, and uplifting, not to mention AI, which might pose a serious risk to everyone beyond simply having different and potentially dangerous cousins. The issue seems to be not that some folks would fear their mutant cousins or their reckless experimentation coming home to harm them, but rather that it wouldn't seem like every civilization would take this attitude and do so indefinitely. Many would, but many would not, meaning it doesn't hit the non-exclusivity condition of the Fermi Paradox and just becomes a minor filter. I found myself thinking about the idea more though, and a disturbing scenario came to mind. Normally I assume once you start colonizing the galaxy, Pandora's box is open and you can't stuff the genie back in the bottle. The cat is out of the bag and you keep on colonizing. What if instead you had some colonies and one or more posed a threat to their homeworld or seemed to, and the still vastly superior forces of that homeworld came by and obliterated them, then decided to keep on doing that? Even if later periods of their civilization set that policy aside, it was just a matter of time till a new colony arose, presented a threat, and the armadas once more went out to murder their settlements. And as I thought of it, I could think of quite a few other grim scenarios where homewards murdered off their colonies. We'll cover some today and some down the road, including in next month's look at the Fermi Paradox interdiction hypothesis, but the situation reminded me of the Greek god Kronos, from which the name for today's episode arises. Kronos, whose Roman equivalent was Saturn, was the father of Zeus or Jupiter. Kronos was the god of the harvest and the chief of the titans, and was one of the sons of Uranus the sky god and Gaia the earth goddess. Uranus had drawn Gaia's anger when he hid his sons, Hecaton Curies, the hundred-handed monsters, and the one-eyed Cyclops, so they could not see the light. Gaia gathered her other sons and encouraged them to rebel against their father, but only Kronos was willing and was given a sickle by his mother to castrate and overthrow his father which he then did and took leadership and married one of his sisters, as primordial deities seem prone to doing. But his father and mother both warned him that he was destined to be overthrown by his own children and he certainly had ample precedent to believe that, so he swallowed his children when they were born. Zeus, also called Jupiter, was his sixth and last child, and evaded that fate because his mother wrapped a stone in swaddling clothes and Kronos fell for the trick and swallowed that instead. According to one story, he asked her to nurse the child one last time before he swallowed him, and she did and the milk that sprayed from her breast formed the Milky Way in the heavens, and the word galaxy simply means Milky Way in Greek. Zeus grew up and with his mother's help got his father to take an emetic, whereupon he vomited up his other children, and with the help of them and some of the titans they overthrew Kronos and cast him and some of the other titans into Tartarus. Zeus went on to marry his own sister and rule over his older siblings and the remaining titans. 
There is often an implication that Zeus too will one day be overthrown by his own children, and while accounts of all of these vary wildly, it is often implied Kronos ruled over a golden age and that his overthrow wrecked that. That the god of the harvest, who was often depicted by a foreboding crow, might have been doing everyone a favor with his consumption of his children, and that all would have been better had that grim harvest continued. The correlation of the myth to today's topic is evident, and I do not think it is hard for any of us to imagine us coming to fear our future colonies, especially if they split off antagonistically. Indeed the overthrow of deities by their children is incredibly common in mythology, and while the usual interpretation is that this is the fear people have of being replaced or displaced by their own children, there is a wider element of fearing the next generation will do this to the one that preceded it or that a splinter of your civilization will grow to overthrow and replace you. Possibly a settlement, possibly just an ideology or movement that grew to push aside tradition. It is not hard to imagine that we could end up at odds with a future colony. Indeed conflicts between Earth and Mars, or Earth and the Moon, are practically cliché in sci-fi, and space opera often depicts Earth as the evil empire, reaching out to crush its rebellious children. They presumably see it as self-defense, which might be accurate in some cases. The real question though is if you could stuff that genie back in the bottle and keep it there, or could and would keep stuffing it back in. And the answer is maybe. Science fiction loves to show us some colony ward of a few million fighting out the forces of Earth, but in practical context an Earth that can send out self-sustaining interstellar colony ships is one that can support a trillion in comfort on Earth alone and vastly more in orbital habitats nearby, many trillions if not more. If they can mobilize just one in a thousandth of their population to crew warships or join expeditionary forces, even if they had a hundred of these fleets that they could ship around to handle a given problem in some star system, that's implying that just one of those hundred fleets, composed of a thousandth of their population, contains more soldiers than every side combined fielded during World War II. And realistically, that's not what some interstellar colony facing a unified solar system back here would face, that's what rebellious Mars or Titan would face. Either a civilization's population rises or declines or stays static, but if it isn't rising there's not a lot of need to contemplate interstellar colonies except for prestige or redundancy. If your civilization is convinced that those colonies are not a positive, possibly by previous colonies rebelling or unleashing some accidental doomsday device, then they are not thinking of them as prestigious projects or ways to save your civilization from extinction, just rebellious, ungrateful, degenerate, mutant children who might want to help dig your grave. Alternatively, if your population is growing, then while it is likely those interstellar colonists would tend to include a lot of your fast-growing elements, pioneers wanting big families, you are still going to find it cheaper, easier, and faster to build up some space habitats on or inside or from all those other moons and minor planets in this solar system. On the higher end, such a growth of structures around the solar system could easily exceed 100 billion billion people, 100 quintillion, by assuming they need a similar amount of sunlight for their habitats as we do, though they could go way higher than this through greater efficiency post-humanism or simply adding power sources besides the sun. This is a full Kardashev II civilization, or Dyson Swarm, and is very obvious if you happen to be looking at one astronomically, but only if it's reasonably close and you happen to be looking at it specifically, so we could miss one fairly easily nowadays even if it was just a few thousand light years away which would allow thousands of such single Dyson empires in our galaxy scattered around without us noticing. This will be a key point for next month's interdiction hypothesis. We tend to assume that we spot them, expanding and doing that to every system they encounter, that's the Dyson Dilemma that was the start of our discussion of the Fermi Paradox on this show about ten years back. You could spot a civilization doing that to every star in a region of a galaxy or a whole galaxy very easily and a billion light years away or more, and we have not. Now you don't necessarily get those population levels either, indeed unless you're engaging in star lifting or importing materials from other solar systems, a point we'll return to in a bit, then you are going to max out your habitats based on how much material you need per habitat or person and how deep you're willing to dig, so to speak. 
If you're just disassembling asteroids and smaller moons to make very comfortable suburban style O'Neill Cylinder space habitats, you are looking at somewhere in the area of 10 to maybe even 100 quadrillion people living in those and on the various larger moons and planets. Once you start looking at those bigger moons though, you are going up two or three orders of magnitude into the quintillions and more if you go for more urban development. As much as I like star lifting or even mass harvesting plants other than Earth for materials, my suspicion is that those plants will already be occupied, and that experiments with star lifting would preferably be done around another star first, which not only provides vast raw materials but the energy to send them back to our star system. Star lifting itself is very energy demanding and resource intensive. It's self-powered by the sun so we tend to ignore how many joules get used pulling matter out of one, but is in the same zone as shooting material back slowly through interstellar space and both are long-term operations requiring very long-term investments that you set up when alternative supplies are running lower. But I think this is your rough early peak for population in the solar system, something in the quadrillions, and then until you get to that point, it will always be easier and cheaper to build habitats here than found in interstellar colony, and an easier way to handle a growing population. This does not mean you are not colonizing other stars, but it does mean you are probably seeing a much faster growth in raw numbers back here than all of your colonies combined until we hit that limit of somewhere north of a quintillion. There are tons of factors that affect growth rates, and a horrible tendency to try to oversimplify them which has resulted in case after case of laughably wrong predictions over the last century. It could go up or down, but I tend to assume improvements in longevity technologies and automation will see it increase while simultaneously improvements in birth control will see it decrease, on top of any number of cultural factors that will vary from culture to culture and generation to generation and a civilization worried about overpopulation and Malthusian catastrophes tends to see that manifest in a lot of its art, film, literature, and policies, which makes folks a little less inclined to want lots of kids, too. There's a thousand ways in which big or small families can be incentivized or discouraged, often just subconsciously. Too many factors, not enough true long-term data. It's why I usually state the issue, in Fermi Paradox terms, as assuming any civilization that can grow comfortably will tend to over very long times, and am intentionally very vague about what comfortably means. At the moment, using 2021 data anyway, Earth's population grew 0.9% in that year while the GDP grew 5.9%, the year before that was 1% population growth and negative 3.1% GDP, thank you COVID while in 2019 it was 1.1% population growth and 2.6% GDP growth. Best estimates are that we topped 8 billion people back in November of 2022 and should be over 8.1 billion when this episode airs. It is very rare that population growth exceeds GDP growth in recent times, even briefly like it did during COVID, which is principally the result of technological advancement and which I would expect to continue for the next few centuries or even millennia barring catastrophe. I think this implies a golden age that would be occurring even as the ability to affordably and practically colonize other planets and star systems was reached. Removing the land limitation issue growth currently has. More people, same amount of land to live on. It's a major reason for my optimism about space colonization occurring robustly in the not too distant future but it's the period after that which our chrono scenarios are more focused on. When you're starting to see growth in our solar system, the solar system as it's called when discussing others, begin running out of runway while its colonies are just starting to hit their own stride. Let's run through the numbers to clarify that. We generally run around 1% population growth in recent years, and were that to continue, to get to a quintillion people would require we have 123 million times our current population which would take us just under 1200 years, circa the year 3200 AD. A 2% growth rate, which would be way short of the peaks we saw in the middle of last century, would hit a quintillion in a bit under 600 years, circa the year 2600. Half our current growth rate, 0.5%, will get us there in about 2400 years, circa the year 4600. And a 0.1% growth rate, just a tenth of now, would get us there about 10 times longer, 
11,730 years to hit a population of a quintillion around the year 13,754 AD. Even if we assume this very slow expansion rate, that's probably still implying a slow growth on those colonies too, but let's go with the year 4600 and half our current growth rate. Even if we were founding new colonies at 10% of light speed, and hit that full stride by 2200 AD, that means we only have colonized out to 240 light years. There is something like a quarter of a million star systems out to this distance, and presumably the ones closer to home are a lot more populous, though we shouldn't be assuming their growth rate is all that much higher than back in Seoul. That means your population of a quintillion back home would massively outnumber all those other systems. Even if they had an average system population of a billion people, that would still mean you outnumbered all of them 4,000 to 1. And they are not hitting those kind of numbers that fast unless they are arriving with a million person colonial fleet and busting out the cloning vats once they settle in. So they can literally throw more soldiers at the colonies than they have people, and at any time prior to this, the odds have been even more overwhelming. After this, we see a slow tip the other way, but it gives Earth and its allies in the system a lot of time to decide they need to act. On the one hand, this would seem like an unenviable strategic position, surrounded on our sides by potential enemies, but the other way to think of it is a stadium full of people in which some titan or dragon has suddenly emerged, and who can reach out to hit everyone simultaneously, like that hundred-handed Hecaton Kyries that Uranus locked away, and Kronos kept away, and Zeus unleashed to overthrow them and set as their guards thereafter. I think that might be an appropriate mythological reference considering the double-edged sword of unleashing a fleet like that, and assuming they will stay loyal to that cause and either replace the disloyal colonies with loyalists or burn all those planets out and come home. Now we've discussed some defense scenarios in our episode Rebel Space Colonies last year, and the idea of defecting fleets came up there along with options like brainwashing or using robots. But the key notion there is that you have a protracted period where your colonies are weaker than you are, collectively, and a longer period where you could crush many of them at once but not all. And the nature of communication in light lag means you do have a major edge coordinating such an option to launch out from Earth or some alien civilization's homeworld on some terrifying expedition to wipe out your daughter colonies. That means there's a very long time for sediments to grow harsh towards those colonies and them to seem a growing threat before your homeworld has to make that effort. And quite probably, it wasn't at everyone at once, but initially at this or that troublemaker and with mostly favorable reception by their own colonial neighbors. Let's consider Wolf 359, best known to us as a place where Starfleet got it handed to them by the Borg back in the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Best of Both Worlds though also the name of an Outer Limits episode from way back in 1964. Wolf 359 is a real place though, a red dwarf star system just under 8 light years away and an M6 flare star, meaning it's about a thousandth as bright as our own sun normally and prone to rapidly and dangerously brightening for brief periods. We don't think Wolf 359 has any significant planets and a habitable one would need to be much closer to that star than even Mercury and would have itself roasted regularly to remove any atmosphere. When John Meredith arrived there as one of the few scientists about their settlement and mining fleet, everybody understood this was going to be more of a mining colony than an occasion to build another new Earth. The system is rich in asteroids and minor planets, along with cometary matter, and their objective was to go there, set up initial operation, along with the Stelazo system to push freighters up to interstellar speeds to go back to Sol with metals and slow down any incoming ships. After two centuries of build-up and preparation, they began being able to send shipments home and receive new colonists to help build space habitats and other megastructures there. One rebellious movement got their hands on the Stelazo system briefly and used it to send several megatons of relatively stealthy projectiles back towards Earth which had they hit, would have damaged Earth worse than the asteroid believed to have killed the dinosaurs off did. Thankfully this eventuality was foreseen, and the projectiles were mostly intercepted without harm, and those that did do damage were relatively limited. Jonathan Meredith always had every intention of returning to Earth after he finished his work here, and was very much with the Loyalist cause that helped to retake the beaming arrays and await reinforcements from Earth which were able to arrive just over 40 years after the hijacking with the beaming array available to slow them down, allowing travel at 25% of light speed to the system. 
The system until then had been in a four decade long state of protracted stalemate and saw many different factions emerge, with flare ups of fighting and conflict. The force that arrived in system was immense and rapidly restored order, and not too long thereafter Jonathan and a few hundred loyalist engineers were hosted by the Admiral of the Fleet at a lavish state dinner that celebrated them as heroes and asked if they would consider future such missions since their expertise and confirmed loyalty were invaluable. Most of them agreed with the caveat that they were really looking forward to seeing Earth again first and enjoying some of their hard earned rewards. The Admiral laughed and said that would not be a problem and said that improvements to cryotechnology and nanotech meant journeys made in frozen stasis so as not to get as bored. Very accurate brain scans also ensured any damage to memory the previous process sometimes had were almost entirely eliminated. Jonathan awoke in the HD 110067 system, 100 light years from Earth in the year 4024 AD and where several large planets orbit a bright K0 orange dwarf that's over 8 billion years old. As a scientist he spent a good deal of his free time searching for signs of prior civilizations, and the incredibly synchronized orbits of the sub-Neptunian planets here fascinates him. He hasn't got much free time as the big cargo carriers from Earth are en route to the system already and they must get their operation up and running, including their beaming system to slow down ships. Security is tighter at this mining station, their comms traffic to other systems is limited to a very short list of pre-written statements, and he's fairly certain they censor what entertainment and news comes from home. But his work is done here and he and the rest of his team are headed home on that first transport. New folks will presumably be taking on the work here which is mostly automated. The team consists of many old friends from Wolf 359 as well as many other volunteers from other early operations and he was surprised what a great team was assembled for such a remote operation. When the crack team of marines exited the bulk freighter and began methodically shooting everyone, their own lieutenant already knew why he has such a good team. Much like Jonathan's team, they were all volunteers, but after it was decided that leaving inhabited colonies behind for resource extraction was more dangerous than leaving low intelligence AI to run operations once setup was complete. He's met the original John Meredith before and wonders how many of his duplicates he and his own duplicates have killed before. John Meredith and the rest of the assembled mining teams, known as Alpha Team, were duplicated thousands of times and sent two systems with the goal of getting them started for future colonists. Now the new plan is to mine every system they can reach for resources to send home to Seoul. In this way Seoul can expand and grow while the removal of easy resources makes it ever harder for any rogue element to reach a system and access resources in a practical and viable way. The lieutenant and his crew will return on ice for thorough debrief and scanning as soon as they confirm every member of Alpha Team 7342 is accounted for, and the lieutenant suspects, correctly, that there are measures implanted into them to ensure his team either returns or dies. Having grown up in the 35th century where it seemed like one colony or another of Earth's was rebelling every year and his home cylinder in the Kuiper Belt barely survived an attack by some berserker AI fleet, he is content with the strategy Earth and its interplanetary alliance have chosen for protecting humanity from the treacherous children it seeded the interstellar neighborhood with before adopting this tactic, even though he suspects he may not wake up once he goes back on ice from this mission. Some sacrifices are worth it but he'd rather not know, for sure. It is hard to say if a strategy like this could continue in perpetuity, but the interesting thing is that it doesn't need to. Stars are not static so new ones will be entering or leaving your stellar neighborhood on long enough time intervals, but these are very long even on the interstellar travel and colonization scale, and if you are mining out every star system, starting with the lowest hanging fruits like asteroids, You can pillage all of your neighboring systems to the point that eventual colonization of them would be very difficult, especially for anyone seeking to avoid scrutiny and lacking a ton of resources to begin with. At a certain point of depletion, it would be hard for you to colonize those neighboring systems even if you decide to change the policy and actively pursue colonization again. It is also a bit of a scorched earth or scorched galaxy policy, if you ever encounter some alien civilization or some colony did manage to escape far away they might have some thousand light year volume around your homeworld that was depleted of all but dumb but well designed machines that monitor and booby trap that system, 
there's just not a lot of motivation to try to push a beachhead through there, especially given that you know the folks at the center are glutted with resources to defend themselves with, and you'll have to extend your supply lines through hundreds of light years of systems that they've sucked dry already and probably filled with traps. And while you could just abandon those systems entirely after you looted them, it would be more logical to leave some monitoring and simple automated defenses behind. It would not be that hard to make sure fleets sent in by you in stasis to check those automated systems only had the ability to go to a desired system and back, were packed full of vetted loyalists, and stopped in those systems only long enough to make sure the large number of lobotomized machine minds weren't showing signs of tampering or mutation. It is much easier to ensure copy fidelity in self-replicating machines and digital information than with DNA. And even if someone did jump the rails, way back at your homeworld, you've got something bigger than a full Kardashev II civilization that can react with the sorts of forces and firepower that would make your classic space opera Galactic Empire whimper and weep in jealousy. This region of depleted systems might still be home to any number of survival colonies and ragtag pirates, potentially untold trillions of people, but they always have to worry they will get swatted if they raise their head up too high, because they are few and scattered compared to the inner sphere. If all the big resources left over are gas giants and stars themselves, for all that that is 99.9% of the resources in that system, the effort and apparatus need to get at those is major, time consuming, and not even a little covert. You'll pick them up from your monitoring, while alternatively we could be within a few thousand light years of some alien empire that sucked a region dry of easy metals and not see them. Indeed we might easily miss them even nowadays by assuming they were an old cluster of lower metallicity stars. To a civilization that knew what to look for they would stand out like a sore thumb, but the Fermi Paradox isn't about what others could see, it's about what we can see right now. It's also not about what we would do, but what the overwhelming majority of alien civilizations would do. And when it comes to behavior, that non-exclusivity issue gets very limiting. We can make a case that there's no pan-galactic empires because there's no faster than light travel and everyone is limited to sub-light travel. We could make a case colonizing space is too hard and no one does it. But when it comes to a chosen behavior, that they can colonize space but do not, it is a very hard lift and uphill to show why every alien would do that, or such an overwhelming percentage that doesn't matter. The Chrono scenarios are an example where a convergent behavior is plausible. Colonies your planet is far away from do not offer you a lot of new trade and resources, and once you've done a few, they no longer offer much prestige either. The further out you go, the less prestige you get because it's getting to be old hat, the more resources the effort takes and the less control you can exert on them, and the harder it is to get resources from them. All the same time, the more divergent they get, the more different and alien to you, so they are not a redundant civilization in case your sun goes nova. Simultaneously, the further you go out, the more of them there are, loosely rising with a cube of distance, ten times further out, a thousand times the systems, and a thousand times the systems that might turn hostile or invent some doomsday device that can avoid detection or being dealt with while the threat is still embryonic because of the distance. At a certain point, a civilization starts realizing this is going to be far more dangerous than beneficial and begins actively discouraging colonization and perhaps hard feelings escalate with many of the colonies, and potentially becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe they just send out the armadas to blow everyone away, or maybe they're just inviting everyone to come home, or else. Realistically, despite our fears from science fiction, resource harvesting by robots can be done by a machine smart enough to do the job but far too dumb to ever rebel, and which is less likely than not to ever mutate randomly even over astronomical timelines and astronomically expanding numbers. They don't even necessarily go the full Kronos route of eating their existing colonies, just take out the worst troublemakers and convert the others to the idea that they are inside the accepted bubble, maybe 20 light years across and the area outside of there will be actively and aggressively depleted of resources automatically and patrolled thereafter so no one else can settle them. They might agree with your reasoning and breathe a sigh of relief, glad they don't have the same issue of hostile children popping up on their own frontier, hostile to them or to Earth but happy to plow through them on the way there. Indeed, even if starships did escape undetected and unpursued, which is a lot harder than it sounds like as an accelerating spaceship is as subtle as an erupting volcano, 
Their most logical strategy is to burn very nearly all their fuel to get as fast as they can and aim to slow down for a low cost at some distant nebula or cluster thousands of light years away. When they get there in 10,000 or more years, by the time they've had time to grow a colony of any size themselves that might be a threat, they have the very same issues to deal with and may decide on the same spectrum of solutions. Carve out a region of space, drain it all to the center, leave a buffer zone of dumb automated monitors, extractors, and defenses behind, and build some civilization more impressively big than a standard Dyson Swarm back at your capital system and possibly its nearest handful of neighbors. You could even migrate those stars themselves, if you really wanted to. It seems like a bleak picture, but as we'll discuss in our look at Interdiction Hypothesis next month, there's a lot of reason to think this could be a normal behavior out in the galaxy or wider universe. Giant fortress systems stuffed to the gills with megastructures and stockpiled resources surrounded by harvested desolation. The equivalent of building your fortress in the middle of a desert oasis surrounded by sand for thousands of miles in each direction. This isn't really that bleak of an existence either, indeed it's potentially how a full-blown borch planet might get built, cramming a whole K3 civilization into a single star system's volume, where you truly can hop on a spaceship and visit thousands or even millions of other worlds in a few hours or days. There's a lot in this single solar system or small pocket of them for all that it's compressed, which is a good thing since it removes the one big issue with interstellar empires of huge travel and signal lag and it's not like things are tightly packed in a Dyson Swarm, and its big brothers must be less dense for heat dissipation reasons. It's definitely an attractive setup, it just suffers from feeling rather cannibalistic and depending on how you did it, that feeling might be more than metaphorical. But that's the way it's bleak, not for the lifestyle or circumstance of those back inside the inner core. They've got untold quintillions living back home in comfortable and sustainable circumstances and they haven't seeded space around them with potential enemies and any that pop up have little practical motivation to come after them, though irrational hatred is a motivation that both alien empires and distant cousins who survive their approaches to flee to distant clusters might retain. For my part, while I do consider the Chrono scenarios a plausible solution to the Fumi Paradox, in that it offers a reasonably convergent behavior civilizations might move toward and be able to sustain indefinitely, I think the case is decent but not particularly strong either, much like its twin theory, the Hermit Shop Little Hypothesis, where everyone flees the hills from fear of a central threat, I just have a hard time seeing everyone doing this either, without exception or inevitably driven to it. I do not think the reasoning is inarguable, that you have to murder your interstellar children off or ever avoid having them in order to survive. I certainly hope it is not true, that such a grim harvest should never be thought either practical or ethical, but we can't really speak to the variables involved until we actually have some interstellar colonies and see how relations and risks evolve. In a case like this, where our grabby alien scenario tends to assume intelligent civilizations are rare but they eventually start colonizing outward at a decent fraction of light speed, simple hesitation about dangers of neighboring colonies might not prevent them but slow expansion enough to allow that grabby alien scenario to move from several thousand civilizations or less in the universe to several million or even billion without us spotting them yet. Again we just can't speak to those variables yet too many unknown unknowns. But for that same reason, I have a hard time seeing this as a better candidate than simply assuming intelligent spacefaring civilizations don't evolve much, in part just because those unknown unknowns should seem to have different or differently weighted variables with vastly different alien species who followed very different evolutionary paths and social models. On the flip side, it does seem more plausible to me than the various zoo hypothesis scenarios, which tend to be the go-to most probable Fumi Paradox solution after various rare Earth or rare intelligence options. And as mentioned, we'll explore the idea that such distant desert fortress civilizations might cooperate with each other more in our look at the Fumi Paradox and Interdiction Hypothesis next month. Until then, since this is essentially a new entry on our solutions chart, I would be curious what your thoughts are on the reasoning or evidence that would support or sync this set of solutions, probably appropriately for the topic even if I did metaphorically give birth to the Chrono scenarios, albeit with lots of prior inspiration, they paint a sufficiently bleak picture that I would be just as happy to see them swallowed whole.
So as we head into spring, for a lot of our viewers the impending finals week of the semester is approaching, and for many others they're trying to figure out where to go to school or what to do afterwards, the most important study habit you'll ever learn is not to cram. Do your learning in bite-sized bits every day, and keep doing it after school for the rest of your life. Establishing a daily learning habit is one of the most important things you can do, both for personal and professional growth. That's where our friends at Brilliant can help. Brilliant helps you build knowledge in minutes a day, with fun lessons you can do whenever you have time, it's the opposite of mindless scrolling. Brilliant focuses on fun and interactive learning, and is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively, and if you watch this show you know how valuable knowledge of statistics or AI or other areas of STEM can be in every aspect of your life. Brilliant has thousands of lessons on these topics, including tons of interactive visualizations of neural networks and artificial intelligence. From simple to complex, whatever your skill level, Brilliant customizes content to fit your needs and lets you start where you should and improve at your own pace. Try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for full 30 days. Visit Brilliant.org slash IsaacArthur or click on the link in the description. You also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So today we were talking about civilization being afraid of its colony as being a threat, and this Thursday on April 7th we'll talk about the various threats to Earth, mundane and strange alike, as we look at defending Earth, be it from asteroids, aliens, AI, astronomical explosions, or just mundane human threats. Then it will be time for Sci-Fi Sunday, where we'll be looking at the idea of stargates and parallel devices for bridging between worlds and ask if there's any theories bridging between science and sci-fi there. Then we'll take a look at a different type of tunnel, the immense lava tubes on the moon, and what life in those might be like for lunar settlers. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you'd like to donate or help in other ways you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Galactic Beacons at go.nebula.tv/isaacarthur. Thanks for watching and have a great week.